The VIP show is brought to you by ASX listed Brookside Energy, ticker BRK, a premium US focused oil and gas producer. With its important held by production drilling program complete, growing production and revenues, and a very strong balance sheet, the company is perfectly positioned to capitalize on its large inventory of proven low risk, high return development wells. Now on with the show. How are you now? Broadcasting from the VFS studios at Milson's Point in Sydney. You are listening to the all new BIP show season five, episode five. Don't forget to hit subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. And a reminder that all the financial information in this podcast is generally in nature. Only speak to a professional advisor about your needs. Now also there's a big disclaimer that I've got on, on this show and, and will be on this show for the next few weeks. Our sponsor is now Brookside Energy, which is great. There's just a thing. I mean, that, that, that they are a sponsor and they are helping keeping the show alive, which is great. I'm an advisor and I do own the stock and I do advise clients on the stock. However, when I do this podcast, I do it from the from the from the point of view of someone who is well, sort of like a journalist, I suppose you could say, but definitely someone who just wants to interview interesting people and not to spruik uh, my advice and not to spruik what I do. So there is a, a, a clear separation of church and state in that. So thank you very much, Brookside, for keeping the show alive so that we can help people through whatever it is that we help them with. Now, that is done. Uh, so, yes, my name is James Whelan, Investment Manager at uh, at here at VFS Group, but that's not what I'm doing right now, as I just said. I skipped Davos to be here. Um, so, you know, you're welcome. You can thank me later. Uh, it, the time is 11.04 on Friday, the 5th of August, 2022 AD. My guest today is Chris Berg, Principal Research Fellow and Co-Director of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub the world's first dedicated social science research centre studying blockchain technology. Very cool. Based at RMIT University, Melbourne. In 2019, here's a bit of a this is your life thing, Chris. Uh, in 2019, <laughs> he was awarded the RMIT Vice Chancellor's Award for Research Impact, which is cool, and the RMIT College of Business Award for Research Impact, which I just said again. That's great. He was awarded the Australian Libertarian Society's Libertarian of the Year Prize in 2018, which is fairly, I'm fairly certain that's, how I came to know who you are because you are a vehement libertarian, which is great. That's why we love you. Um, and my father, who was also big in the libertarian movement, g'day Peter, if you're listening as well, um, probably would have been introduced to you about a thousand years ago. First off, Chris, how are you now? Thanks for joining us. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, that's a that's a list of accolades that I don't always expect. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, well, man, you can't paste it off the website. That's what you get. So it's, um, <laughs> I don't know if they're real, but if if someone told me that you got them, then uh, that sounds believable. That, that's fantastic. But you are you are a, a uh, an absolute asset to the RMIT crew, an asset to the to crypto, which does have a future, I believe. And we're going to get to that in a second. So um, yes, yeah, so you would have met Dad. Now, there's a story that I keep on getting reminded of, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> you met you met the old man years ago, probably a decade ago, I suppose. And I guess you you would have been telling him about this thing called Bitcoin. At the time, and I remember then Dad getting on the phone to me as I was. I, I think I was just an ops manager. I wasn't even advising or anything like that. And he was just like, "We got to buy some of this Bitcoin, James." I'm just like, "I don't know how to do it. It's only used for to buy black tar heroin on the dark web. I don't know. I don't. I, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm supposed to be able to get access to it." It was about six cents at that time. Um, it's currently wherever it is, even if it's twenty grand, it would have made us many, many billions of dollars many times over. Um, how often do you think I get reminded of not? buying Bitcoin for my father, Chris? Look, probably as much as I remind myself that I wasn't really buying Bitcoin then either. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. <laughs> it's, look, I mean, back then, it, it, it's interesting. It was a very difficult thing to figure out how to purchase it. Mm. Even um, the idea of going onto some sketchy website, and they were all sketchy websites, exchanges at that time, and, you know, throwing in, you, you would have to KYC, send them a picture of your passport you'd have to connect up your bank account it was difficult and it was difficult in a way that sometimes i worry that we haven't quite surmounted yet it's still quite difficult um which is one of the reasons that you know people like to say that we're so early in the crypto space you know we, we are very early because that user experience hasn't really been solved yet yeah and i think that also getting into the regulatory side of things because it still sits vaguely in this gray area between regulated and unregulated. Now, we'll get to that in a second. So first off, um, g'day to online magazine Dimash, which is uh, they interview me a, a lot about cool stuff, future stuff. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I often appear on the list of very awesome people who they interview, I'm sure. Um, uh, their recent article, How to Be Extraordinary, received numerous comments about me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. 
they asked me to talk about crypto and that's great. Now, instead of now, because I'm so lazy, I didn't want to send them back an email. I thought I'll just do this, ask them the question, ask you the questions that they were going to ask me. <laughs> and then I can just send them a link and it's going to cover all bases. Right. So Thomas, mate, this is me cutting some corners for you. Um, and so we'll, we'll get this into the, into their online thing. Demarge is a great website. So go and check it out. But what we've seen overnight, Chris, is um, Coinbase Rocket up, was up about 30% at some stage first thing this morning on the back of news that it started a deal with BlackRock to provide crypto to its Insto customers, which is great. That's bringing legitimacy of crypto uh, up a bit from where BlackRock have spoken about it quite uh, negatively in the past, it being a bit of a Ponzi scheme or fraud haven, I think they said. Also on the same night last night, the Meta CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, who I hate, uh, announced that the company has added an, inst an integration with Coinbase's wallet, among other third-party crypto wallets, to the Instagram platform. That's a This sort of news is very positive for crypto. Are we tentatively okay to say that it's sort of moving more into the legitimacy that, that we need it to be? I mean, look, it, it has been for the last uh, couple of years. There's been more and more integration with traditional platforms obviously you you can do things like trade crypto on Robinhood. of course as australians we can't but others can yeah. um uh, there's a increasing integration of crypto assets in um in in lots of different banking products around the world but there's there's also something that i think is underestimated which is that you know th there's two parts of the crypto crypto space there are these new unusual assets like starting with bitcoin ethereum all the peculiar DeFi protocols all the strange nfts that no doubt the listeners are familiar with um, but there's also um traditional financial assets using crypto um uh, infrastructure to make trade uh, to 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 be tokenized and to make trading and settling those assets a lot easier and i think where we're seeing the institutional involvement in crypto is actually on that how can we tokenize traditional financial assets and how can we deliver them to our an existing customer base much more efficiently and effectively now my thesis is that these two worlds are going to collide i, I think we're seeing these two worlds colliding the the wild and wacky crypto side of the market and the tokenized traditional financial asset. But it's in that traditional financial asset tokenization that that's where we're seeing really substantial institutional involvement. Yeah. Now, do, do you want to just charge straight in with a few examples of that of where it's of, of, of the use, the best uses going forward of where the valuable is? Because I was going to, we're going to talk about the crypto winter. It sort of feels like it might have been passed a, a bit. So we can get to that in a sec. But what are, what are some of the ones that are going to survive and actually come through as, as being strong? If you've got any, just, if you've got any specific cases, uh, I'm all ears. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we have a lot of really important use cases now in crypto. Um, so we've got um, decentralized finance, we've got non-fungible tokens, we've got decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. I think the most perspective and what I'm most excited about right now is the, the decentralized finance or DeFi rails that have been built that allow for really complex and interesting and innovative financial products to, to be deployed immediately online completely globally completely open access to anyone who wants to use them so now we have systems where you you know basic borrowing and lending systems we've got these um really innovative and interesting stablecoin mechanisms we've got mechanisms for um building derivative markets all using very different assumptions to the traditional financial system but all completely open access now what i think is happening in um the financial sector more generally is that um uh, people in traditional institutions and large institutions are seeing these innovations on crypto rails and thinking well how can we bring our assets into this incredibly innovative space um so th that's where i think that that's that's genuinely very exciting um and where i think we're going to see a lot of the big use cases but there are other use cases as well and as i was saying i think the um what we've seen in in the last year or two is the involvement of institutional players building out their own private blockchains putting traditional assets or tokenizing traditional assets on those blockchains and using them to um trade and settle um, in, in just a more effective and efficient way. So for example, um, it's not well understood, but JP Morgan, JP Morgan quite famously has been, um, uh, skeptical of things like Bitcoin and, and the open crypto rails, but JP Morgan has its own blockchain. 
JP Morgan has its own stable coin on that blockchain, and it is using that blockchain to settle tokenized assets like debt instruments, fixed income products, all these sorts of um, traditional assets that it shares amongst its clients. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the innovation that we're seeing, put, put price aside, the innovation that we're seeing in infrastructure, um, the innovation that we're seeing in financial products is it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and you know, it should, should give listeners, um, at least some sense that there's a lot of movement and that movement is not going away. Yeah, I, I, I do feel that that's the case as well. So if, if, if all of these different places have their own, now I'm going to ask it, I'm going to sound like a complete dumbass on this one. They've all got their own different blockchain. What, how does it, how do they integrate? How do they cross over? Do they need that's to? That's one of my favorite questions, to be honest, okay, because I think <laughs> the, the most important thing from a blockchain infrastructure perspective is how we can get um, multiple blockchains to interoperate with right, each other. Right, right, right. How can I get an asset on one blockchain onto another blockchain. And there's lots of technical um, answers to that. And we're doing that right now. We've got bridges, we've got inter-blockchain communication protocols. We've got all these sorts of ways that I can take an asset from one chain to another chain. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing a lot of innovation there as well. The next step will be bringing assets from private blockchains onto public blockchains and, and of course, vice versa as well. We are starting to see that. We're starting to see the interoperation. But over the next couple of years, I think that's going to be where where a lot of the big movement is. It already is in the public blockchain space, I should say. People are already bridging assets from one blockchain to another. I'm interested in seeing what happens when we start bridging from these private institutional systems onto public systems. Yeah, okay. So that, that is one. How far off do you think that, like on timeline, time frame sort of area we're going on this one? Look, unfortunately, it's slow because of the high regulatory requirements of institutional players. Um, so obviously, you know, institutional services, they have, uh, you know, you have to be, they're subject to all sorts of sophisticated investor regimes. Obviously, there's re really strict and sometimes unclear AML, KYC obligations. Um, those problems are being solved, but they're not solved at the pace of crypto. Crypto is fast. Crypto is 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 scarily fast. There are new products and um, uh, tokens launched all the time. Institutional players are a lot slower than that. Um, uh, but we're ta we're talking years, but we're not months, but we're not talking decades. Yeah. Okay. So so it's it's, it's within within the, the short term future, which is fine. Um, Within a cycle, that's really, really what we're talking about. No, okay, so the, 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 that's fine. The let's go specifically now, and then I'll, I'll do a quick ad. But the which coins? I mean, let's. If you had to own, I know this sounds like one of those those, those ones that you do all the time. But if you had to own some coins right now, what would you? What would be in your wallet? Well, I want to be really clear that I'm not a financial advisor, and I may it's, have positions. It, in it doesn't count. I'll tell you, this is this is the thing. This is the thing. It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I see what you did there. That's very funny. Yes, thank you. But okay, technically, technically you know, here's, here's the gray area because because crypto doesn't count as a financial product. Talking about it and advising it is 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 just completely into a dead area of it. It's not actually yeah. anything. So go ahead and say whatever you like. Which, <laughs> not, which is you're not which bound I, to I like say there is a really substantial problem with that, right? So yeah. that the the issue is that crypto is complicated. Using crypto is complicated, it, not just from a you know what what to token should I buy, but from a how do I custody it? How do I and and where can you get that advice? Now we've got a huge financial um, advisor system that you would think could be able to provide that advice, but because as you point out, it is largely an unregulated or from a financial advice perspective, it seems like an unregulated market. Yep. No one wants to give you that advice and that makes it more dangerous for crypto users anyway. Yep. So I, I, I think there are a lot of problems, but we're, we're, we're in the middle of what looks like a crypto winter or a bear market. If I'm, if I'm investing at this stage, I'm thinking about what is the infrastructures that I know are not short term, but long term. Yep. Yeah, investments. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, writing it down. Yeah. Tell us the price, son. There you are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I can't do that, but I can. Yeah. I can say, like, I'm interested in layer one chains that have sophisticated smart contract capabilities. So, um, an obvious one is Ethereum. I, I like Bitcoin. I think that people should be holding Bitcoin. Another um, 
Uh, I'm really interested in interoperability protocols. So I'm interested in the Cosmos ecosystem and many of the um, app chains that are um, uh, being developed out in that ecosystem like Osmosis. Um, I'm interested What's an app in- chain? Sorry, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm just going to cut in with, I don't know what some of this stuff is. Um, yeah, no. And, first off, uh, sophisticated smart contracts. So sophisticated smart contracts, um, uh, sophisticated smart contract platforms, really. Um, and, you know, the, the classic is Ethereum, um, but there are a lot of others, um, Avalanche, Solana, um, uh, a, a, a huge range of um, projects that are providing layer one blockchain services. Okay. Um, uh, then there are some um, cross-chain projects like uh, Cosmos and the Cosmos ecosystem, and they connect applications that are their own chains um, in the Cosmos ecosystem. And some of those chains are things like Osmosis, which is a um, distributed ex or decentralized exchange. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm interested right now in um, infrastructure plays. I'm interested in looking at um, the sorts of things that all crypto projects are going to need to use. And if I was investing, those are the things I'd be investing in. So what did you have here? You had, you had Ethereum, you had Bitcoin, obviously, um, which needs to be in the I, I, I think Solana will do well. I think yeah. Avalanche will do well. I think Algorand will probably do well. I think Cosmos will do well. Um, I think Osmosis will do well. Um, and yeah, a range of things that, that are yet to be launched as well. Oh, that's great. That's great. So of all of that entire list, I hold one of them and it just got hacked the other day. So that's fantastic. Cheers. Solana. Yeah, yeah, well, no. yeah. As long as you didn't have your, um, uh, as long as you didn't use the slope wallet, then you're fine. I don't know. It's on Binance, mate. That's how that's, that's, I, I, <laughs> I really, I really am just, I've got, I've already got a job and I'll tell you what, if the financial advice industry does need to, oh, first off, hang on, I'll do an ad. Uh, Brookside Energy, uh, ASX listed Brookside Energy, ticker BRK, a premium US focused oil and gas producer. They sponsor the show and thank you very much for them. Um, they, uh, it's got an important held by production drilling program, which is complete, growing production and revenues and a very strong balance sheet. It is very strong. The company is perfectly positioned to capitalize on its large inventory of proven low risk, high return development wells. That's the bit. Now, thank you very much for, uh, for helping keeping the dream alive. To the Brookside Energy guys. Now back to Chris. Uh, yeah, so it, it's it's kept up. Uh, if the financial industry does want to move in this direction, and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll bone up on it. So like everything else, where I have to keep my fifty hours a year um, compliance level, I, I'd be more than happy to. I would be more than happy to advise clients on on these things and know everything about it. Until that time comes, though, I have to have I have to have something that's a little bit more important in front of me on this one. So that's why it's kept in Binance. I've checked it. I've checked my wallet once during this entire crypto winter, which is <laughs> probably a, a bit a bit less, probably calmer than I would give myself credit for in, uh, in something that's going on. Like <laughs> so now going back to the crypto winter, what what do you think caused such, such a significant blow up in some of these things? Yeah, I, so there's, there's proximate causes and there's long-term causes. Um, uh, the long-term cause is that the Federal Reserve decided that it was going to um, – uh, you know, stop pumping money into the economy and start trying to deal with the inflation that it's caused. Yeah. Um, uh, crypto that has, been, trading, that has been covered quite significantly on this show. So I, we, I, <laughs> I, have, I have no doubt. But crypto, yeah. crypto trades as a high-risk tech asset right now. It's highly correlated to um, uh, tech assets. And it's unsurprising that as those assets go down, in fact, it leads that decline in 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 valuations as those go down it goes down and because you know it is as i said it's a risk on asset it's probably the most risk on category of assets that you can invest in yeah um that and, and and that's the high level picture and when historians look at this period in time that's what they will explain as the cause of the decline now yep. there are however of course some very specific things that has caused caused particular ructions in particular crypto markets um the main one the most important one was the collapse of a stable coin called um, UST, which was uh, on the Terra Luna network. Um, UST, it's a, a complicated little stable coin, but um, uh, UST was what we call an algorithmic stable coin in that it was a piece of clever financial engineering that was intended to keep the price of this UST token at exactly $1 US. Yeah. Um, now, unfortunately, the way it was built, 
is that um, it works really well when the demand for holding UST went up. But as the demand for holding UST went down, it had a death spiral. Um, this was built into the design of the system. It was obvious at the time that this was a high risk um, uh, if, if there was some sort of easing of demand for that token. Um, but as, as, as there was that easing of demand, the entire project collapsed in close to a space of 48 hours, um, just completely unwound the token um, that backed it up. The governance token that was supposed to um, provide its value went from something like $120 to, um, to, to you know, two cents yeah. um, in, in the space of 48 hours. An incredible um, mind-blowing collapse. Anyway, so that collapse um, led to the collapse of a number of other projects, mainly uh, a number of other um industry players the big one was called three arrows capital who had been which was basically a uh some people call it a hedge fund some people call it prop trading fund um it's, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's i class it as a hedge fund yeah look, look there's some dispute about whether they had external money or not um uh but anyway so they were highly exposed yeah to terra luna they were exposed to a few other things that um, didn't work out well, but they were very highly exposed to Terra Luna. And so when Terra Luna collapsed, so did them. Turns out that a lot of players in the industry had been lending to this hedge fund, Three Arrows Capital, um, uh, on a completely um, uncollateralized basis or very extremely low collateral levels. And so as Three Arrows Capital collapsed, so did they. Anyway, we see these sort of collapse, these this cascading collapses in financial markets all the time. Um, what's particularly interesting in the crypto space is how public and visible they are, because often we can see what happens on the chain itself. We can watch liquidations. We can see businesses, organizations, um, entire protocols collapse in real time, um, and they get un and when they unwind, they unwind really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, even just the financial area. I mean, the, the 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 when people need to get out of something, the the spreads to widen up, and if if you've just got to liquidate, you've got to liquidate. So yeah, that's all true. The big and, and we should always remember as well: these are twenty four hour markets too, which yeah. means that they operate in different ways to many traditional financial. Um, assets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on a uh, Mount Gox. Anyway, we'll go into that. Uh, we, we I'm not going to go into that. That's um, a lot of people did not know that Mount Gox actually stands for Magic the Gathering Trading Online Exchange. Uh, no, it's a it's a small it, community at that stage. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was for trading cards for, for Magic the Gathering. It was, it was phenomenal, and people were just like, "No, it's Mount Gox. It's, like, it's a card trading exchange. This is where you put your money seriously." Anyway, <laughs> um, and, and that's sort of it. And a lot of people coming through now. I'm looking at uh, I, I, it's just that my mind of which big case is coming on now for the for the bankruptcy hearing in the in the back of all this, um, and there's a lot of people who are putting their uh, uh, putting their statements to the judge about why how much money they lost. It was it was a, the the high yielding DeFi thing, wasn't it? That people had their money invested with it, receiving eight, nine, eleven percent. I can't remember what they called them. Yeah, so so a lot of people put money into centralized companies that promise to give you a yield of say ten percent on your Bitcoin yeah. or ten percent on your Ethereum. But these were these were centralized companies. These were basically um, uh, uh, they they were they were funds. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the way that they were getting those yields was by lending to um, hedge funds like Three Hours Capital. So when Three Hours Capital Collapses. They're downstairs. unable to. They're unable to unwind their positions. They're unable to pay out um, to to their clients, to their customers. Um, yeah. What is owed? Do you think? And this is a question probably for both of us, but a question for you: How how far off do you think that we are of having these products packaged up in a proper ETF, uh, in exchange traded fund that people can then hold on their own on their own portfolios? Because that's that's the main. Like things like this stop that from going ahead. Yeah, so they they are um, they are on their way. Um, there is an interesting story about um, uh, the Grayscale ETF, the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF, which is not a spot ETF. It's ETF. It's, it's as I understand futures. Bitcoin futures. Yes, and and one of the reasons that Three Hours Capital got in trouble is that it was arbing the difference between the Bitcoin price and the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF. Um, uh, and that that arb turned from positive to negative, and they turns out they were stuck in 
stuck in assets that they didn't want to be holding. But that's a separate point. The um, Australian Securities Investment Commission at the moment is looking into a Bitcoin and Ethereum spot ETF. Okay. Um, I don't know that there's been any applications, but they've put out a number of consultation papers um, uh, considering under what circumstance that they would accept um, uh, these ETFs. Um, and they, 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 their conclusion is basically only if there are enough, uh, so for example, futures markets, we're confident in the price, um, you know, there's enough price feeds and so forth. And really they're stacking the deck so that it could only ever be Bitcoin and Ethereum. But, you know, that, that, that I suspect is on its way. That, uh, that is, and I mean, I don't want to talk about the regulator too much because someone always picks it up whenever I talk about the regulator. <laughs> I'm a big, I'm happy big, to. <laughs> big fan of the re- big fan of the regulator. That's uh, that's how that goes. That's all right. But uh, they they take as long as they would need to take, and and no longer and no less longer. But you, you know that when they get it done, it, it it will be done with all of the due consideration that is required for something as as tricky and as potentially risky as this is. Yeah, look, I, I think this is a difficult position for a regulator to be in because I know that ASIC, and they've made statements to this effect, they don't think that a lot of these crypto products actually fit into their existing um, uh, jurisdiction. They don't think it it matches any of the categories of the Corporations Act that, that would give them some guidance about how to do so. Yeah. I think that it's easy to blame the regulators for either going slow or um, uh, not being certain, but fundamentally, this is a problem for Parliament. Parliament needs to decide how these things should be regulated. We shouldn't be asking ASIC to um, just make a guess. That's that's not a healthy way to regulate an economy. Maybe Parliament a, has to make a decision about what to do. An amendment to the Corps Act or something in there as well. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. where that has to be. And then, yeah, otherwise, yeah, and, and then you know where you stand because all ASIC really is is doing is just having. Re- um, re- trust me, I've, I've studied this many times. The uh, it's, it's really just having recommendations and regulations that are in line with what the Corps Act is wanting them to do. And, and that's, that's really all they go. So, yeah, yeah, I can see where you're coming from that inventing this whole new thing is probably up for Parliament. That's great. Uh, now, finally, we've gone through the usage. We've gone through which, which coins will probably do okay. We've gone through the reasons for the crypto winter, which is great. Now we're going to go through. Um, anytime I talk about Web3 on Twitter, I am met with vitriol. And that might just be because my attitude to it is that and this is at the beginning of the year, I said Web3 sounds like something I don't really need to pay attention to yet. And the the hatred that I received in response to that was pretty significant, which is always great for when I when I do that. Get that. From anonymous from anonymous crypto enthusiasts, which is great. They're my favourite people too. Uh, and then about a month ago, I did say, well, I, I think I retweeted that one with a, well, it's a good thing I didn't bother to learn about Web3. Chris, do I need to learn about Web3? And if so, if well, you know what, could you just tell us what it is, please? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about it this whole time. Okay. Web three, Web three is another way to think about crypto and blockchain and their economic significance. So the way I think about it is that we've gone through generations of internet infrastructure. The first generation was Web One, and Web One was the generation of the 1990s, where um, there were firms or um, some individuals who would present stuff for us to read. Web One is read. Right. Um, Web Two is the 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 environment that we've all come to be used to. It's the social media. It's the contribution. Web Two is read and write. Yep. What Web Three is is read, write, and own using. Um, uh, distributed systems, distributed ledgers, using blockchain technology, using tokens, we can not just participate in the web, but we can actually put things that we can own. We can put financial assets, we can put intellectual property, we can put a layer of property rights over digital infrastructure. We started with Bitcoin, but now we're talking about all sorts of complex cultural pieces, complex financial products. We can own them and we can own them natively to the internet. So we're, it's, it's, it's not different from what we're talking about. It's just a different way of thinking about the significance of crypto and blockchain. Okay. Well, is there a huge need for that to have happened? I mean, this is a pretty, pretty leading question, but a lot of people have joked that Web3 developers and designers and VCs they're fixing a problem that doesn't actually really exist. 
Well, I mean, have you seen the internet recently? I, I, it's absolutely I stay, a problem. <laughs> I, try, I try and stay the hell away from it as much as possible. I mean, it, it's, a hu- it's a huge problem. We, we have engineered, just because of the, the, the technical constraints, we've engineered an internet where the only way for us to participate is by being advertised to. It, it, there's no way. We, we've, we've, the largest companies in the world are large internet advertising companies that give us access to services for free, which is wonderful. But by doing so, are violating our privacy now if we've got a natural online native property rights structure around our digital services that gives us a huge opportunity for innovation and control in a way that we haven't had under the sort of google facebook amazon yeah. um environment that we've been living in for the last 20 years i think it's it, it, it the idea that you know rethinking how the internet works is not necessary is just i i i find that a staggering idea and i i hear like you i hear it all the time but you know uh, the internet's very broken this is a way to fix it okay i can see that and i i, I do always keep front of mind what are the, the studies on the generational changes and attitudes to data specifically their own personal data and people like my parents would they're just giving their data away for free you know you want an email address take an email address if you want uh want to know uh, how many kids I went or where I went to school. Great. You can t- just, just have it. I'll, I'll punch it into a thing. Dad had his phone number on his Facebook page for a while there. That we, you know, we had to take that down. But the, uh, today, Peter, I'm, I hope he's still listening. I'm sure he is. But anyway, it's things, things like that. My generation, where I'm, I'm in this millennial um, sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm the earliest generation. I'm the oldest millennials uh, that, that, that there are. I'm an 81, born in 81. Even that data I just gave away freely, I shouldn't have done. But but we're, we're sort of a bit more cagey. We understand what we're giving away. Hey, you know, I, I know that you don't, I don't want to give this away. I definitely don't want to give it away for nothing. The new generation that's coming in now and, and that are coming up understand the value of their data. And they, they do understand that there is a cost on it. And if you want it, you got. I, I'll sell it to you, but I want to get remunerated for it fairly. And, and yeah. so does this solve that problem? Yeah, look, I mean, there are applications and there are projects that are looking precisely to solve that problem. So there's lots of um, uh, Web3 social marketing systems. There's lots of data management, data DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. There's all sorts of innovation working on that. There's nothing that um, is going to replace Facebook or Google quite yet, but that's where so much of the innovation is. Um, This is a hard technology to use. Uh, but it is absolutely being used and is going to be a part of our everyday lives um, from here on. Okay. Well, I now know what it is, so I now know what it is. That's great. Uh, look, with nothing left to go over, Chris, unless there's something else that you wanted to say, speak now for a volunteer piece. No, not at all. Um, if you're happy, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I'm going to, with my brain full of information, I'm going to put this in the can and then probably get a can in my hand. So... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Chris Berg, for joining us, uh, Principal Research Fellow and Co-Director of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. I look forward to more catch-ups like this, mate. This is sensational. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and a note, obviously, everything on the show um, was general advice or even basically not advice at all but because of what we're talking about, ironically. Uh, you can find us on iTunes at Bip Show or wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Twitter. I don't know why. Um, we're, we're, I've also got a website where all this stuff is kept too, which is which is just for storage space as well. If you want to know about um, VFS and, and go to the VFS site, don't go to the, the, this other site. Google Wheel and Capital and follow the links to the BIP show. I'm going to put a link to Chris's most recent paper. Are you okay if I put that recent one? That yeah, you did? of course. That, that, that going back over the origination of, I actually read it, can you believe it? But we didn't go into it because it's really, really pointy headed. But it's a fantastic paper. <laughs> I will link to that paper as part of the overflow notes. Um, this show is produced by Johnny Walker, uh, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. The Bip Show is brought to you by ASX listed Brookside Energy, ticker BRK, a premium US focused oil and gas producer. With its important held by production drilling program complete, growing production and revenues, and a very strong balance sheet, the company is perfectly positioned to capitalize on its large inventory of proven low risk, high return development wells.